particularly to cultivate uh, action and projects that are supportive of a really dynamic, sustainable, and equitable food system in the Southwest region of New Hampshire. Um, and tonight's film, Growing with the Grain, uh, hopefully you had a chance to see it, great film. Um, it is a production of the Hudson Valley Food Hub, whose mission is to foster an equitable and ecologically resilient food system in the Hudson Valley. We're very excited to have Sarah Brannon here from the Hudson um, Valley Food Hub, as she is the Director of Regional and Community for Food Initiatives. And Sarah Cox, who is our MC, will introduce a little, talk a little bit more about her and also our other great panelists who are with us tonight. Uh, real quickly, I wanna to plug tomorrow night's film, which is the last film of the film festival. Uh, Melinda Mosier of the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation will be facilitating a conversation with two really fascinating and successful female BIPOC farmers around things found in the short documentary, Farmer C. Farmer C highlights Clorinda C. Stanley of Green Heffa Farms, a B Corp tea company and natural health brand and educational resources, which is 14 acres in Liberty, North Carolina. C has become a well-known advocate for BIPOC farmer, farming and has numerous videos online about her pas passion for regener regenerative agriculture. Kai Farrow, who is a farmer and a lot more at Susu Community Farm will be joining us, as well as Hari Maya Adkahari, an immigrant from Nepal and farmer at Fresh Start Farms in Manchester, New Hampshire. So the registration is in the chat. Please register for tomorrow night. We'd love to have you. Um, I have to thank our sponsors without whom we would not be doing this. Uh, they are CNS Wholesale Grocers, Prime Roast Coffee, Tasulis Realty, Frisky Cow Gelato, Yankee Farm Credit, WS Badger, Savings Bank of Walpole, True North Networks, our incredible film and festival sponsors, Monadnock Food Co-op and Monadnock International Film Festival, as well as Monadnock Conservancy, Stonewall Farm, Archway Farm, the Hungry Diner and numerous in-kind sponsors. Thank you all. Another plug, Radically Rural is a wonderful uh, networking and education, uh, uh, large uh, conversation and conference that happens in Keene, New Hampshire every year. And on September 21st or 22nd, um, there a lot of the members who are at this panel tonight will be at, in person at the, can, at the panel discussion around the grain shed movement um, at Radically Rural. So I really would, we would love to see you there. Um, the coalition MFCC will be hosting a connecting, a connector or a event with food, with beverage, hopefully maybe some brews um, to talk about how we can grow capacity for the grain shed movement in the Monadnock region. So please put that in your hat. Um, I'd like to introduce Sarah Cox, who is a farmer and member of the Northeast Grain Shed Alliance. Um, she is our MC for tonight. Sarah has long been interested in grain value chain from cover cropping and animal feed and forage to milling and the culinary market. Growing corn with her family at Tuckaway Farm in Lee, New Hampshire for a local tortilla company and milling cornmeal for home buyers and seacoast restaurants over the last decade. She was awarded a USDA value-added production planning proposal grant for 21 and 22, assessing the needs of a seacoast and broader New Hampshire collaborative grain economy. I don't know about you, but I'm very excited for this conversation and I will turn it over to Sarah. Thank you so much, Roanne, um, and to the whole festival. Um, I am very excited to be here and to have New Hampshire be a part of this Green Shed conversation. Um, we are very inspired by work happening in Massachusetts and Vermont and Maine and New York, and it's exciting to be a part of that work. Um, I think the first thing I'll do is just go around the circle and give a little introduction that I have on everybody. And then we've got a few questions. Um, to start out with, and then we can just open it up. Um, 
and respond to the film as a whole. So I'll introduce Sarah first. Um, you got a little bit of that, but Sarah is the Director of Regional and Community Food Initiatives at the Hudson Valley Farm Hub. Um, and you can correct me on anything or add anything, um, which produced Growing with the Grain. Um, she previously worked at the New York City Council advising on economic development and food policy issues. Um, and we're just really thrilled to learn about the work happening in the Hudson Valley. Um, Christian and Andrea Stanley um, own two businesses in Hadley, Massachusetts, Ground Up Grains and Valley Malt. They're founding members of the Northeast Grain Shed Alliance and the Craft Malt Guild. Um, passionate about growing a vibrant farming economy, very generous with their knowledge and expertise. Um, and they've been real game changers um, in moving forward and expanding the local grain economy. Um, and I'm very excited to meet Sam on the panel. Um, Sam and his wife left academic jobs in Oklahoma, moved back to Keene, New Hampshire, and it sounds like grew a baking hobby into a really thriving, beautiful artisan bread business, um, an award-winning business that was recognized by Food and Wine Magazine as best bread in New Hampshire. I saw that, um, congratulations. Um, so I think this is a great panel. It has a lot of representation. And I'd love to start with Sarah um, and just hear about what's been happening in the Hudson Valley since uh, the work that you showcased in the film, which hopefully everybody was able to see. Sure, thank you so much, uh, Rowan and Sarah and Deidre for inviting me to be a part of this. And I was surprised and flattered that our little film in the Hudson Valley made it all the way out to New Hampshire. So uh, thank you so much for having me here and happy Earth Day to everyone. Um, since that film was was produced, we have continued doing the on-farm variety trials in collaboration with Cornell and our extension office in Ulster County, New York. And for those of you who don't know, the Hudson Valley has a really long history of agriculture. The farm that we operate um, is about 1600 acres. We've recently been able to transition the entire farm into organic production, which is uh, an exciting accomplishment for us because it had been a conventional sweet corn commodity, sweet corn farm prior to the nonprofit taking it over. And when that film was produced, we felt like we were at the very initial proof of concept stage because grains had not been grown in the Hudson Valley for at least a couple hundred years. And we were inspired by some of the work being done elsewhere in the Northeast. And I don't know if Andrea remembers, you were one of the first people we called to figure out how can we research grains in the Hudson Valley? And you were one of the only, you were one of the people that kept coming up in conversation, call Andrea and Valley Malt, they're actually doing it. So I still feel like we're toddlers. Um, we were infants when that movie came out and I feel like we've made it to the toddler stage of grains growing. But the exciting thing is we have a really robust community of people interested in grains. So we have a lot of artisan bakers and retail uh, storefront bakeries that are popping up in small towns throughout the Hudson Valley. And whereas we were one of the only farms growing wheat and especially spring wheat, hard red spring wheat, which is what you would want for um, a nice loaf of bread. Um, now there are a handful of farmers who are growing it at a larger scale and that is really exciting. So, it feels like we're, we're evolving and growing as a community of people working in grains in the Hudson Valley. And um, it's, just a, it's just a really exciting moment. Yeah, and I, what I loved about the film is that it really showcased all the pieces of the puzzle. Um, you know, Mark at the end of it was saying, you know, this is, you're seeing from the breeder to the grower, to the miller or the, you know, straight to the monster. And to have that full of a chain involved in it is what's so exciting to see. Um, Christian and Andrea, I was hoping that you might reflect on 
the film in relation to your own experience building back this local and regional economy and the work that you've put into that. I know that you're both, you know, instrumental to the Northeast Grain Shed Alliance um, and where, how you feel the state of that grain shed is in this moment. You know. <laughs> you know, the big question. Um, no, I'll just say that, you know, we, we've had quite a journey. I mean, we basically started our business with like a credit card and a crazy idea. <laughs> and, um, you know, we started our first harvest. I was reflecting on this with people because of where we're at now, but our first harvest was us putting grain in our two car garage of our house and trying to dry it down in there and figuring out what to do to fast forward to now where, you know, we're embarking on this venture to expand our operation where we have a grain hub now with, you know, I don't know, the I don't know how many bushels of storage we have, but almost, you, a, million almost a million pounds of storage. Um, we're able to take, you know, any kind of truck you can imagine into our grain handling facility now and do all kinds of stuff with that within. And um, it's just been quite an evolution over time to see how um, things can change. But I think what we have to remember in that is it takes a lot of time. We started Valley Malt in 2010 and we're finally getting to the stage where we can actually have something that is like a really amazing business in my mind and it's impressive when you see it where our roots were really in just like trying to make things work and trying to make things happen and i think we all just have to remember that it takes time that even when we're thinking about new varieties and those kind of things People are so used to our Amazon culture right now where you order something and it's here next day. That does not work in the grain world. Like we're planning two years from now what kind of grains we're gonna plant because if you're planting winter varieties, you know, if you wanna change variety, you've gotta be so far in advance than um, where you're at. And, you know, we're looking at what we're planting in the fall of this year for malting in 2024, I guess, or 2023, I don't know, late 2023. So it's just like all that stuff takes time. And um, just remember that it, you know, we're kind of like in the slow food movement where it's going to take time. And some years, you know, last year was the worst year we've ever had and our, our 12 years of being in business and just, um, yeah. I think part of the grain shed movement and part of all this is educating people how things work in agriculture and the grain world and that it's not Amazon, it's this natural cycle that takes time and infrastructure takes time and growing grains takes time. I don't know if you have to add anything. No, I think yeah. that was well said. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate all of that um, as a grower uh, also. Um, <laughs> just knowing what it means to plan out field rotations and what we're trying to do with regenerative agriculture and plan long rotations. Um, and what it means as a grower to work with all the way to the purchaser and how you communicate you know, some of those needs that can slow things down. Um, and I'll come back around to the, the idea of placing local grain economy in this sort of slow food movement. That brings up some thoughts for me. I'd love to get back around to later on the non-commodity aspect of grain, of the grain world. Um, but Sam, I would love to hear from you a little bit um, in your experience, because I know that you are working as much as possible with local grains, I think, and have developed a lot of relationships there. So I'm curious um, how that's been for you, what kind of challenges you've had in sourcing local grain. Um, and just if you could talk a little bit about how you've developed those relationships. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I can tell you kind of what it looks like from um, kind of the other end of the chain, I guess, um, or at least one end of the chain. Um, and uh, I mean, I think that the film did a, a, a nice job of showing just the interconnections that you, not only that you want, but that you need for this thing to work. Um, 
And, you know, we've always milled grain. I think we're, we're one of the bakeries and a lot of bakers are trending this way where they want to, they don't just want um, local grains, they want to be milling it themselves. And, you know, <clears throat> that can be a challenge. It's a whole other technical skill to master. Um, it's typically in small limited shops with small limited personnel. So milling is, bringing milling into your operation is already one major technical, financial, and sort of staffing commitment. Um, but um, so we've always done it and we've done it, um, you know, I think over the years we've in gradually increased it as we got more comfortable with, with milling, with sourcing grain, with working with the grain. Um, and it's been really rewarding. I mean, the connections you make with farmers, obviously the sense that you contribute um, not only to your community through the food you make, but through um, I think helping uh, be an outlet for um, new or established farmers with their, you know, with their, um, with their grains. Um, and it's not always a linear path, as I'm sure most people involved in this understand that there's some backsliding, there's things that happen, there's climactic events, there's pandemics, there's global grain shortages, um, and they can both amplify and, and slow down these kinds of things. So I think it is important to realize that, um, I mean, I guess one thing I would say from my perspective is that I'm not, I'm definitely not an apostle of like, we're not an apostle of whole grain breads at our bakery. We love to use them and some of our breads are whole grains, but we also love white flour and I love white commodity flour, but partly because it allows me to, uh, it helps me subs help subsidize our, um, our investment in local grains, which are quite expensive. Um, on the production end when you're, especially now with inflation when we're trying to keep our prices down. Um, it's a big commitment if you wanna, if you wanna mill um, and purchase grain locally or regionally <clears throat> and mill it and use it in your bread. So there's all sorts of compromises you have to make. Um, I mean, I don't even really see them as compromises. It's all, I think for us about putting out a good product responsibly. Um, I do think that we've had, just to give you a, a sense of the last couple of years, um, our issue has, we lost, so we lost two farms over the last few years. One stopped growing grains, uh, I think in, in favor of hops, um, and another farm, uh, uh, Whitesfields farm, which produces a lovely, uh, wheat down in Hardwick, Mass. They lost both their rye and their wheat this year to the rains and storms, which I think might've been somewhat localized there because all their wheat got sprouted before they could get it all out of the fields and their rise um, couldn't, they had too much uh, toxins in them. So they lost both their crops, um, which then had us scurrying for another source, which um, now we're um, getting grains from Charlotte, um, Vermont at Nitty Gritty Grains, and they're a much bigger operation. Um, but being in a place like Keene, um, and I probably like a lot of places in New England, we're not at a great, like, it's kind of difficult for us to get quote unquote local or regional grains because a lot of them don't go through the distributors. Um, Whitesfield's family, they, they drive the grain up to us because their son lives in Springfield, Vermont. Uh, Charlotte, in Charlotte, Vermont, they send it down by Green Mountain Messenger, which is typically a guy in a Prius that ends up with like our grain at our door. Um, so the, it, it can be difficult to get the grain, you know, um, as ironic as that can be, you know, um, sometimes um, yeah, local grains can be quite difficult to get a hold of. So, you know, but they're all, all of this to say that it's been a wonderful adventure for us and we're moving now. We just ordered a new um, French stone mill. It's a little different than some of the other stone mills out there. And uh, we're gonna be going entirely to sort of um, uh, fresh milled flowers um, and building a new mill room. And so, yeah, we're, we've taken the leap. <laughs> so it's good to hear what everyone else is doing. Yeah, thank you for all of that. That that's all great information, and I think that the distribution channels and the centralization versus the localization of how we work with a crop like grain. You know, when you're talking about infrastructure and storage, post harvest storage and cleaning, um, all of those issues are just massive in terms of how growers share um, those needs that come up and. Um, than how we work on getting the grain uh, to purchasers. Um, so 
you know, I really appreciate that angle on it. Um, and in the same vein of the conversation, and I'll maybe back to Andrea um, to continue that, I'm thinking, you know, as purchasers of local green, how you see the economics of this green shed moving forward in a way that can support all the all the players or partners along that grain chain. Um, this is what Christian was talking about, the slow food aspect of it. You know, I see local grain as a non-commodity crop. You know, it's not trying to substitute for commodity grains. It's its, its own product um, unto itself. And I think that's because it is focused on flavor and it's focused on health. That's not just uh, health to the to the person eating it, but health to the soil and to climate and just all of those aspects of how we're growing that grain. Um, but everyone in their own business is obviously dealing with their own thresholds and price points um, and looking at how to have this economy at a human scale. I think Sarah, you mentioned that in the film and I think it's such a really big aspect of this when you're looking at um, the malting and the brewing and the kind of acreage that you need to do this kind of work and then smaller partnerships with maybe smaller bakeries, sort of how that all comes together. So I didn't know, Andrea, if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I don't, the economics of things is, can get a little confusing because there is a decent amount of diversity in how grains are being grown in the Northeast. So you have some farms that are maybe in Western New York and they have, they steward 2,500 acres and 600 of it are gonna be in grains. And that's in a rotation with corn and soy. But then you have a smaller dairy farm in New Hampshire that is has certain land that they prioritize grain um, and that might be 50 acres and they might not have the infrastructure that the farm in New York has. Um, so, and then you have, um, farms like, um, Sam was referring to like in Hartwick, Mass, where they might be growing, I'm guessing maybe 20 or 30 acres. It could be a little bit more. Um, and so I think that the economics just have to work at whatever scale you want. Like that having that diversity is something that we probably want to try to maintain as much as possible. Um, but like, I know for us, just in being who we are, we do want this to be at a certain scale where I would love to stay 10 years from now, we're supporting 5,000 acres of local grains being grown in the Northeast. And so at that scale, we're not gonna be commodity by any means, but we are gonna probably be priced differently than somebody who's growing 20 acres and milling that in on their farm or something like that. And so I think we do have to just be really, I think having a conversation like this and being conscious of it and understanding how every, every level of that you know, it has to work at every level economically for people. Um, otherwise it's, you know, it probably won't work. So, you know, I would love to see it continue to work that way. One of the ways that we can do that in our business is if we have a brewer who is like, I want to support this farm 20 miles down the road from me and I'll pay whatever, then we can just facilitate that whole relationship where it's not going to cost what our normal malt would cost. It's a special, you know, contracted thing. Um, but it allows that relationship to take place almost with us, you know, just being a middle person. Um, other ways is that we can, and we do buy grain at a higher rate, depending on the farm size that we're buying it from and just figure out a way to like blend that into our other grain supplies to sort of, you know, come to a, a price point. So, you know, there's different ways that we try to support farms at different size through our businesses. 
Um, and then I just think, yeah, as a grain shed to be, you know, have, have those bakeries that are willing to, you know, buy from the person that delivers in the Prius and probably spend a lot more than what they would spend for our flour or our grain. So, but I too want to add just like one thing I envision us as, and our business is that we are like the quintessential middle processor. Like we do a really good job at like the malt house is a perfect example of taking this product, adding value to it in this big process that takes a lot of time and then selling it to an end user. But part of our business too, and I could see this at Hudson Valley as well, and would like to know more about what you guys are doing, but it's like our grain hub that we're adding, part of that use too is so that every baker doesn't have to find a farmer to work with. Like if they wanna support local grains, they can come to us. We can take a truckload of grain and put it into a 50 pound bag that they can use in a mill at their bakery, how they wanna do it. And so we're kind of creating this whole locally based supply chain that's somewhat modeled on like the bigger supply chain, but we don't source, we only source our grain in the Northeast and we can clean it, we can package it, we can do all these things for you that sometimes when you're dealing with a farmer directly is harder. And then two, that helps build relationships because we've seen so many times, like I'll, I'll just call out hemp, like hemp was grown around here and there are all these big promises. And then I know warehouses of hemp sitting around because there's no buyers. So it's like- With like 60,000 pounds. Yeah, okay. with 60,000 pounds. And they're hemp. like, can you mill it? Can you put it into yeah, flour? Yeah, yeah, what can we do with our hemp? And so I'm just using that as an extreme example, but it's like, like we serve as a buffer so that like we can work with farms and we don't mind if you know the farm, but like we can work with them so that they have a bigger market than maybe just one bakery, you know? I think that's all. To, oh, go ahead, please. I was going to echo what Christian just said. After that film in our first few years of very small research plots, as we started talking to farmers in the region and, and bakers in the region, we came up against the same series of gaps in the supply chain and also the knowledge base in the Hudson Valley. And Farmers, even if a farmer wants to develop a relationship with a local baker, the infrastructure for post-harvest handling for grains is really, really expensive. So you need a seed cleaner, you need um, adequate storage, you probably need a dryer bin in the Hudson Valley because we're a very moist climate that has extreme temperature fluctuations and Last year was also our worst year since 2014, just the amount of rain. And the grain, in, growing grain in the Northeast is really vulnerable to disease and vomitoxin. And you're not necessarily from an organic growing system going to get the same per acre yield that you're gonna get in Kansas. And for us to build up the, the grain economy in the Hudson Valley, we knew we had to invest in some infrastructure. So we also put in some grain bins and a seed shed um, where we can keep the grain cool and dry because ideally you wanna hold that grain for a year or more because there are so many seasonal fluctuations that for example, we held back some grain from 2019 or 2020 be, and I'm so glad we did that because in 2019, we had entire crops fail because of the rain and we just didn't even harvest them. We just plowed them in. So I guess great, more organic matter for the soil, but we didn't get any grain off of them. Um, and so that storage infrastructure is really, really hard for farmers to um, pay for if they're not at a certain scale and if they don't have those outlets. and even though I agree with you, Sarah, that we're not um, we're not a substitute for in in a strict sense of the the word for the commodity grains, and at the same time, in order to support the system overall, I think we do need to be within striking distance of affordability for people, and that is hard. I know for us, we want to make sure that whatever product we're growing and producing 
is accessible to people in our own community. And getting that to a certain price point is really, really hard. And right now we're also putting in a mill. That's our next stage of development, which I'm very excited about. And knowing that the federal government subsidizes commodity grain growers in the Great Plains, they will pay them 21 cents a pound freight on board for finished flour that is then sold into the school systems for school food products. And that is all subsidized. And then you have a lot of smaller and medium sized growers, which can't even necessarily access crop insurance for their small farm. So um, I do think we need to start finding a way to get a little bit more volume. Um, so we're moving beyond like one woman, one mill, one man, one mill. Um, and, and I think we're gonna try to see if we can't get to a slightly larger scale um, in order to, to support an accessible price point, but it's still not gonna be gold medal because that's not a sustainable model either. Absolutely. Um, I feel um, like that, I feel like oh, that. that conversation is, uh, integral to this whole thing is is what's the true value of this green and what's the access and how do we bridge all of that and some of that is I think like Sam was saying um, and Andrea also mentioned you know you're you're not bringing in into only this green um, for all sorts of reasons one like Sam said they have a lot of breads that they like to make with that commodity flour that works for them but using that helps support purchasing in this other flour at a higher price point um, but these things like the school nutrition programs and working with SNAP and finding ways to spread these costs and um, support some of those costs so that you're not diminishing the value of the crop itself or to the grower um, but that you're providing that accessibility um, and I think, Andrea, I don't know if you want to speak to, I think there's Northeast Grain Shed work going on around sort of increasing that accessibility model. Is that? I, if there is, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Yeah, I know that um, it's, it's just at least a part of the conversations that I, I feel like when you're talking in this sort of grain shed community, I think we're all aware of of that need, that food access and cost of food, no matter the true value of producing that food is a true human issue. So. Yeah, and if I could just speak to the accessibility thing, I mean, obviously Please. cost is the first thing that comes to mind, how we you know, pass on those costs to consumers. I think that there's also an issue of cultural accessibility, um, especially mm -hmm. when you're talking about not just local grains or regional grains, that's like a whole nother, Thing, but even whole grains, you know, as a baker, you come face to face with the fact that a lot of people love white bread and I love white bread, you know, and we're, we're milling, we, we, we're, we've, part of our milling operation is going to be basically producing a lot of white flour, but it's a, it's a much what they call fatter white flour because it's a this special mill kind of just, just takes off the very bit of bran and leaves a lot of the nutrients in there. But my point is, is that I think with our uh, commitment to sort of um, regional grains and fresh milk grains, um, we have to translate that into to customers in a way that's price is part of it, but it's also about like, hey, let's move you out of your comfort zone and let's try this, this spell or this buckwheat or this corn or this maize. And um, you're, when you do that, I mean, you're, you know, you, you come up against like the sort of, you know, um, I mean, people can pretty be, be pretty immobile when it comes to their palates. And if you can't get people on board with a loaf of bread that's a little outside their, their comfort zone, at least from a, from a bakery standpoint, I mean, a lot of these grains are going into beers and into sort of other sort of products, which probably don't have as much of a problem. But I mean, for me, a big, a big challenge is just not making people feel comfortable that this stuff's okay. And I don't want to, 
I think my, my point about commodity flowers is not that I love commodity flowers, but I think one of our projects of the bakery is to make, is to sort of demystify baking and good food. And I think the idea that we have before the pandemic, we had a lot of workshops in the bakery. And I, I, I do feel like I, I want people to feel like they can make a great loaf of bread with gold metal and King Arthur flour too. And it's, that's a place to start. You know, I don't want to sort of mystify the baking process to the point where it's like, you can only make a great loaf of bread if I get my grain from this farmer and I mill it on my French mill and I, I have to make the bread within 12 hours of milling it and all this stuff. I mean, that's great. That's what we're interested in. But I also want people to feel like, you know, this isn't beyond them either, whether it's buying it or making it or tasting it. Can I tell the difference between a loaf of bread made with wheat grown down the street versus across the country? No, I can't. I like it. I enjoyed the process more and I'm prouder of the loaf. But if you're talking about objective case or subjective case, you, you can't. So you got to tell the story. I think the stories are important and that's part of this whole, you know, developing these local networks and pathways is, is developing stories. And that those come from, as you said, um, Sarah, a, a more human scaled system. Stories just sprout there like, like green. Right? And then you have stories that you can pass on to your customers and they like that. They like it so much that it'll make them feel like the bread tastes better because they know it. <laughs> what the green is. I think it goes both ways. I think it does taste better and, and it does. Um, yeah, I love that. And I think, I, I don't know, do you do farmer's markets anymore or was that before you opened the- Us? Yeah. Oh yeah, we can't, we try to, it's like, yeah. Yeah, but- Just they they haven't suited us either, but the that ability to sort of come to a new market and have just that person walking by have a sample and talk to you one on one um, is such an important component of yeah. you know that education of that bread and and yeah. and that flavor and that's where you sort of sort of say now you can taste it because now you know the story and um, yeah for sure yeah I, I definitely appreciate that um, we had somebody just comment just um, in gratitude for everything that you guys are sharing. Uh, they didn't have a specific question, but thank you to that person. Um, and then Rowan was hoping that um, we might talk just a little bit more about the Northeast Green Shed Alliance um, and what it is promoting. So um, whoever wants to speak to that most, Andrea, is a, I know you're sort of a steering committee yeah. uh, founding member there. Sure, yeah, no, and, and I think, um... The Northeast Grain Shed Alliance is kind of a overarching organization to try to bring together the work being done on the state level. So New York kind of had its own grain thing, Maine had its own grain thing, and then New England kind of, you know, had little peppering of things. But the Northeast Grain Shed is the idea that as a unified Northeast, including New York, Maine, down to New Jersey, we are trying to establish an identity as a grain growing region and be able to like market that value to the consumer in order to sort of drive more demand for local grains. So it's kind of like, if you see, you know, like, I just got, I was reading a New York Times article this morning and got an ad for Wisconsin cheese and just how awesome Wisconsin cheese is. And it's like the Wisconsin Dairy Farmers Association just doing like really excellent marketing for what they offer to the world, which is amazing cheese. <laughs> and so, um, I think it's that kind of idea that it's, we want something like that, like that sort of, you know, got milk, no farms, no beer, like something to really catch the attention of the consumer that might already be in the camp of wanting to support local farms, local economy, and just try to, you know, increase the amount of acres, demand, awareness, um, it feels like with some of the grant funding that's happening through the Northeast Grain Shed Alliance, there's um, gonna be some effort into doing more variety trials and then testing at various levels of 
you know, from the from the the Sam Baker that has his own mill that could take 200 pounds and try out this new variety to a mill like us to give to some of our customers so that if we if there were areas where we see gaps in needing a more regionally adapted variety of a particular wheat or barley, um, it would be in that system of doing variety trials. And that's gonna be UVM, University of Maine, Cornell, all participating. And, and we're then, trying so hard to get UNH yeah. and New Hampshire in there. It oh. has been, so we, we maybe side conversation, but I, I am pushing and pushing. We do not have an agronomist at UNH focused on grain. You could, always, don't. You could always just get, um, they could provide you with all the seed. And if you could do it on farm, you could potentially be an on yep. farm partner. Yeah, we're definitely talking about um, joining that variety trial. I'm so excited because we, we can do that grow out. We could do that here. We could do it on one of our, we could do it at one of the research farms if they wanted to. And then, you know, year two, year three, you're starting to grow out that seed. But yeah. whereas Vermont and Maine, New York has this incredible research um, university system, our land-based, you know, college at UNH has, is just missing that piece. Um, so I'm meeting with a few people coming up, really trying to figure out Where's the funding? Even if it's a postdoc coming in who wants to establish a position for themselves in this, you know, um, how do we work together to get that person who can then be out in the field with people? Because all these other universities, we're, we are gaining so much information from the researchers that, out, that is out there, but we need to be specific to our New Hampshire climate too um, and develop that here. So Sam, you're nodding your head, I think. Yeah, UNH really needs to, can I say, to step up in this. So we're going to try to help that happen. It does, it does seem like the university systems, although, I mean, uh, Sam, uh, sir, you mentioned it, the Hudson Valley and Cornell. I know a lot of the green farmers in Vermont, UVM has been huge. They've helped us with some of their um, flint corn trials. And then Massachusetts, I think, I know the, the farm down in Hardwick, I mean, they, they got on to their um, farming through UVM. And of course, I think Maine Grains, Maine Grains, and I think University of Maine. I don't know quite so much about that, but I do. I did meet one agricultural extension scientist from UNH, and he was working with. You know, there's a lot of dairy farms in New Hampshire that are transitioning, or yeah. he said that they had expressed an interest in shifting over to grains. And we had a conversation yeah. this probably before COVID um, to try to because we'd be interested in like, you know. Uh, helping to fund trials. I don't know how it works for individual farmers to be like, hey, why don't we, why don't we for the next three years, try a couple acres of this grain? I mean, we, we'd, we'd love to, but like, you know, it would, we would need an intermediary to help uh, a baker and a farmer communicate, yeah. right? Because, um, and so, yeah, I, I do hope that you and if you have some, some traction with UNH, because it does seem like New Hampshire's, um, could be doing a little bit more some of the university and the thing. Great, we, yeah, I think that the, oh, please Sarah. I was gonna say we relied really heavily on our extension office and there was someone there. We have sadly since lost him to the Pacific Northwest, but he was just so important in getting that variety trial up and running at the farm hub. And yeah. now um, we still send our grain up to UVM's lab by mail for testing and they're excellent. And, um, and then there's a new grain lab opening up at Hartwick College in New York. And so now there are two places that um, you could send grain out for labs, um, which is cool. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm the, this is an example of where that North Sh Northeast Grain Shed Alliance work, the variety trials that they're doing with all of those places, okay, well, we can hopefully slide into that and we'll just help fill in the puzzle of what does it mean in the Northeast? What, what, what do these different regions mean? Um, Ruanne is telling me that we're just a couple minutes away from 40 minutes. So I would love to know, does anybody have any exciting piece of the puzzle or news they wanna share that people might be interested in? Um, I'm not completely sure who's in our audience. I, if anybody in the audience has a question that they want to put to anyone, please do, because we're going to close up fairly soon. 
Um, if you don't get anything, I'd just like to hear just maybe a little tiny bit about the, the upcoming new film around uh, what that you're putting together at the Hudson Valley at the Food Hub, um, which is kind of like part B of Growing with the Grain. Yeah, so thank you for that, Ryan. We are working with John Bowermaster on the next chapter of the story, and it'll focus on our exploration and development of this grain facility, grain processing facility in the Hudson Valley. And I will say, um, you really don't know what you're getting into until you're halfway through it. That's what I'm experiencing right now. Uh, but we have been traveling all over to learn as much as we can about milling. We went down to Kansas. We went up and met uh, with Farmer Ground Flour, which is a really awesome mill up in the Finger Lakes region in New York. And um, we are launching a new uh, mill called Milestone Mill. Uh, at the end of this year. So that's really exciting. And there will be a new film on that next year talking about the next phase of this work and trying to use that as a, a lever for supporting regional farms so that we can provide some incentives and support to them for going from just experimental uh, grains all the way to incorporating grains into their regular rotation and having a market outlet for them um, in our region. So stay tuned. Thank you. We can't wait. Yeah, good luck. Very exciting. Thank you. Yeah, Any anyone else? We... Yeah, I, I guess we can close. I just want to say, uh, Wow, what an incredible conversation. I learned so much. Um, all the questions I had written were answered long before uh, within the first 30 minutes. So I, again, I just wanna thank uh, Sarah Cox from Tuckaway Farm, Lee, New Hampshire, uh, Sarah Brannon from the Hudson Valley Food Hub. Thank you for joining us from Kingston, New York. Can't wait to see the film next, next year's version. And then the Stanleys, um, you guys are just, you're, you're like, uh, you know, the rock stars of this movement. And um, I'm just really grateful that you're not that far so that um, we can keep in touch. Um, and Sam, I don't know what to tell you. We're addicted to your bread. I'm so grateful that you're in King. You've made life there a lot, a lot more uh, palatable. I'll put it that way. Um, so thank you all for what you do. I, uh, two things. One is that this recording is going to be available on our website, Monadnock Farm Community Coalition. I will make sure that all the panelists get it and Sarah so that you can share in your, your own social media. Um, big plug to the New Hampshire Food Alliance, which is our state committee that is trying so, diff you know, wholeheartedly to try to build a, a really uh, connected voice of agriculture for our state. And um, our uh, annual event is coming up. Don't ask, I know it's in May, but I'm not quite sure when. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's the New Hampshire Food Alliance. Um, they would be the folks that would be, um, you know, definitely advocating on behalf of the type of trials you guys have been alluding to. Um, and uh, tomorrow night, Farmer C, two great panelists, two BIPOC farmers, um, really both extremely interesting women um, who are real movers and shakers. Um, and I just want to thank you again. And we hope to see you at the Radically Rural Conference in September, where some of the people that you're here will be there in person. And again, the coalition, the Nanook Farm Community Coalition will be hosting a get together afterwards. Hopefully we'll get some brewers, other bakers, distillers and farmers at that event. And thank you again, Dee Fitzgerald from uh, the Mananoc International Film Festival for putting this all together for us. And thank you all audience members for coming tonight.